welcome to the Flourishing Introvert Talks with me, Joe Rawbone. This is the podcast that celebrates the natural gifts of introverts so that we can flourish in all situations. Episode 188, Finding What Lights You Up. I received a message recently from someone who was following my flourishing journey and she said, I feel like I've been searching forever for the things that light me up and bring me joy. Can you help me? This is something we always cover in great depth in my programmes, as it's the foundation to authentic flourishing and to creating a fulfilled life. And I'm pretty sure lots of people will be able to relate to this frustration. So in this episode, I thought it would be helpful to share some signposts and actionable steps for those not yet in one of my programmes or in my membership. I'll start with one of my favourite concepts, and that's the westernised version of Ikigai. I covered this in more detail on episode 38, so once you've finished this particular show, I strongly suggest you loop back to that for a deeper dive. I'll pop the link in the show notes for easy reference. In short, a simple definition of Ikigai is the value one finds in day-to-day living. In other words, the origin of joy. In the westernised version of Ikigai, also known as the Venn diagram of purpose, there are four intersecting circles which are what you're good at, what you love doing, what you can get paid for and what the world needs. The overlap between what you love and what you're good at signifies your strengths or passion. I talk about strengths so frequently because owning them and playing to them are central to a fulfilled life. If you're not yet clear on your strengths, do take some time to get clear. The overlap between what you love and what the world needs highlights your mission that thing you're drawn to do, your quest or calling or destiny. The overlap between what the world needs and that which you can be paid for points to your vocation. Typically, this is at the centre of your job or career. Finally, the overlap between what you can be paid for and what you're good at is your profession. And the reason it's called the Venn diagram of purpose is that at the intersect of these four circles, you'll find your sweet spot or purpose. It's living from that place that will probably reap you the most joy, the most fulfilment and the most satisfaction in life. If you complete that exercise honestly, and it will take some time to do that, what's at the intersect will also give you joy and it may change over time. I've noticed that as I've aged, things I'm good at have changed, as have the things I enjoy. And come to that, the things I'm prepared to do for money has changed too. And we might as well have a full set. Given the state of the world right now, what the world needs has also changed. The result? Well, clearly this is not a once and done exercise and needs revisiting regularly. I take my discomfort as a sign to revisit my ikigai just to check what, if anything, needs amending. So that's always going to be my starting point for someone wanting to find what lights them up and brings them joy. But it's not the whole picture. So let's see what other signposts I can show you that point to joy. We're going to start by delving into our childhoods for those of you who feel safe to do so. And if you don't feel safe to do that, please seek the help of a professional and qualified trauma therapist. Don't let your unhealed child wounds mar the rest of your life. For those who are prepared to delve, I invite you to think about what brought you happiness then. I was fortunate in that my parents had quite a large garden, flower beds and a pond near the house and vegetable garden beyond the hedge towards the bottom of the garden. I loved being out there and some of my happiest memories are with my mum in the greenhouse, pricking out seedlings. 
The smell of warm, damp compost and ripening tomatoes takes me back there in a heartbeat. This taught me to tune in with all of my senses, something I still try to do in my life and in my work. I remember long summer caravanning holidays in the New Forest, which is in the southwest of England. As a young child, I would take myself off for hours gathering lush, plump green moss so that I could piece it together to make a doormat outside our caravan steps. I would add to that mat almost daily and by the end of our stay it would be more like a carpet than a mat. On reflection, that's such an introvert thing for me to have done. My equivalent these days is to piece together bits of data so that it becomes useful information or pieces of a client's story so they can see the whole and what comes next. It's like pieces of a puzzle. I was expected to learn to play the piano but could never read music in spite of having lessons for eight years. So whilst playing was not my thing, listening to music certainly was. In fact, it's how I learnt to play by listening to the piece my teacher would play me and then replicating it. I have eclectic taste and find it always moves me and often moves my body. When I need to recharge, one of the things I'll do is a quick dance break. I find it works wonders for me. I would take myself to bed early to read and I've always loved to lose myself in books. My childhood favourites were The Magic Faraway Tree by Enid Blyton and in fact I still have my original copy which is over 60 years old as it was a hand-me-down from my sister. My other favourites were Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan, all fantastical books that allowed my imagination to run wild. I haven't lost myself in enough fantastical books recently and I'm making a commitment here and now to do more reading for pleasure in order to free my logical mind. These days my reading is more academic or for research. I don't lose myself in quite the same way but I will bury my nose in a book at a moment's notice. I'm also a frustrated artisan and it was by my mother's side that I learned to bake, sew and knit. By my father's side, I learned how to disassemble machinery and equipment. These things still bring me joy, and I have a long list of things I plan to try, including pottery, silversmithing and shoemaking. I get great satisfaction in creating something, in seeing an idea from concept to creation. All in all, I still indulge in the equivalence of those childhood pleasures to this day and they are partly responsible for the joy and gratitude I feel about everyday life. Another element is being clear on my values and living in alignment with them and that has become increasingly important and might be a useful signpost for you too. When I was younger, I sold my soul for a job or a promotion then I reached a point where I was no longer prepared to sacrifice my values in order just to line mine or somebody else's pocket. My personal values have shaped my business principles and so I have a strong guiding star now that keeps me aligned and therefore content. I wonder why we dismiss contentment these days. It's like we're supposed to want so much more. For me, contented is about balance and about being happy with what I have. I know that Buddhism and Stoicism have contentment as central pillars of their philosophies. Maybe these days contentment is associated more with stagnation and complacency. Maybe that's why there are so many mental health challenges. I say, let's try on contentment for size for 30 days or so and see how that feels. It's central to my gratitude practice, which is about being thankful for what I have rather than always wanting more. How much more joyful would we feel if we were contented with what we have? It doesn't mean we don't improve or grow. 
just may be that we allow ourselves to feel the depth and breadth and beauty of what we already have. When I reflect on all of these things, I can see how they have influenced my career and business choices. I have always had elements of these in every job or role I've undertaken and the absence or loss of them is what helps me to decide to move on. And then the choice and the letting go is so much easier. If I think of my business right now, it entails designing training courses, taking an idea from concept to a deliverable product. To do this, I need to use my imagination in order to create something that meets a brief. I also coach individuals and groups, which means being really present and using my creativity differently. This time, rather than looking for solutions, which is what I'm doing in course creation, coaching requires me to see patterns, to notice what's not being said and to ask questions that get the coachee to find their own solutions. Then there is the organisational consulting, which requires a mix of the two. I'm not the sort of consultant who borrows your watch and then tells you the time. Isn't that the old joke? But the message I'm delivering is often somewhat unpalatable. So I do need to get creative about how I change people's listening and get buy-in for my suggestions. I need to be brave or quietly gutsy, as I call it, and purposefully curious so I ask questions that invite insight and progress. With all of this, there's no one right way which really appeals to my need for variety and my love of learning. I'm just coming out of a period of overwhelm and I do have a ridiculously long to-do list that I'm reworking. Whilst bobbing about in the sea last week with the wonderful mother of a lovely friend of mine, I committed to re-look at my to-do list and decide what really needed to be done and what could be delegated or ditched. The problem with having a creative mind is that ideas spring unexpectedly from somewhere and I get so excited by them that I add them to my list. But some of these ideas are great, but not for now and maybe not even for me. As Elizabeth Gilbert talks about in Big Magic, her book about creativity, she says... Ideas are like entities searching for a willing partner to bring them to life. If one person doesn't act on it, the idea might move on to someone else. I rather like that concept and it stops me from getting upset when someone else does something that I thought about but didn't take action on. It's part of what I talk about as collective consciousness. So it's okay for some of the ideas on my to-do list to be erased, knowing that someone else might pick them up and do something with them. This is like anti-competition, which is much more aligned with my way of thinking. Then I saw a Facebook post proclaiming the real to-do list, and I've stuck this version on my wall so I can see it regularly. I can't quite decipher the true origins in order to give due credit, but I think it's from Mommy Om. Anyway, the real to-do list read, laugh, sing, read under a tree, count your blessings, hope, hug your little ones, walk barefoot in the grass, give thanks, love, take deep breaths, jump in. Those 11 points are so important and I know that my life will feel more joyful if I can just add more of them to my daily schedule. I already do quite a lot of them, but I know I don't laugh enough, for instance, so having this reminder close to hand seems really important to me. I think the big signpost here is to really pay attention, tune in, and get into the habit of observing yourself, almost as a third party. Consciously reflect throughout the day and ask yourself, what joy did that bring me? If the answer is none or little, explore how you can minimise, eradicate or reframe the activity. 
Sometimes the things that we do need doing and only you can do them, which is where the reframe comes in. What other perspective could you view the task from? A growth perspective? An opportunity perspective? A contribution perspective? There are so many different ones to choose from and I'm pretty sure you can find one that fits. And simple language helps rather than I have to do X. How about I get to do X? I choose to do X. Don't fret though. The idea of a reframe is not to deny genuine feelings, but to offer a different, more positive or productive angle from which to view the situation. The reframing technique might not make you suddenly love the task, but it can reduce the negativity you associate with it and make it easier to tackle. Once you start to find joy in life, nurture and cultivate it so you experience it more. Don't save joyful things for best or when you think you deserve them. Be joyful and do joyful things as often as you can. Keep plenty of you time scheduled in, so you have time to just be. Experiment with new hobbies and pastimes as often as you can and keep doing the ones that make you happy. I met a wonderful creative at the weekend who has given me a shoemaker's contact details so I know what I'll be signing up for next and I can already feel the joy starting to bubble in me. So what about you? What are you going to do to find more joy, to bring more joy into your life? I'd love to hear, so do let me know. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, then please subscribe, rate us and leave a comment because we know that that helps other people find the podcast. And if other people find us, other introverts can flourish. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.